Well, happy, happy days, everybody. How you doing today? It's Carpo. This video will be entitled something along the lines of, uh, well, EU theory, electric universe, piezoelectric effects, um, you know, plasma filaments on the Earth and on the Sun, as well as uh, the way that our atmosphere uh, can warn us of impending disasters. And hopefully I won't forget some of the things I wanted to include. Um, <clears throat> I follow uh, the EU theory, the electric universe theory. I'm not going to say that I'm a proponent or an advocate of everything that's taught in that. But, <clears throat> but it's a phenomenal outlook on many of the uh, misunderstood or not understood um, anomalies, say on Mars, which is the perfect example of scarring, which could be due to electrical discharges. If you haven't followed the theory, you'll probably not know what I'm talking about. But for those who have, um, follow along here and see if we can figure out exactly, uh, well, let's not figure anything out. <laughs> let's just theorize. Because I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, um, I've heard too many people quote EU theories by saying, well, it sounds so obvious. It just looks like it's created by electricity. It must be. And then people start promoting these theories with no scientific background. And I'm not going to be one of those people. But when I'm listening to the theories and listening to their explanations for things, uh, sometimes it gets like, it just, a light goes off in my head. It's like, or it goes on, I guess. Um, and the one I watched that they uploaded the other day was about the Grand Canyon. Now I've heard a lot of, uh, <laughs> let's say a variety of opinions on the Grand Canyon. Um, the most likely, or I should say the most supported scientific explanation of the Grand Canyon is that it was carved out over time from the Colorado River. And they recently did some experiments in a lab where uh, someone had a theory that the river may have been there and then these mountains formed around it and they used these two polar charges and showed how dust can collect in these piles yet the river can remain running. Now these are extreme theories. Um, this goes against everything we know about say the layering within the ground um, as sedimentary rocks and various you know ages of rocks build up and then are carved out we see the lines within the walls and uh, trying to say that that was built up is a very Let's just say bold statement. I won't get into the details of it. But while I was researching that, I was fascinated with a link that somebody posted about, um, well, there was two of them, actually. <clears throat> One was about these uh, plasma tubes on the Earth. Say so these plasma tubes extend on, they call it the, what, the ionospheric, lithospheric, something spheric, coupling and it's where all of the different components of the Earth's atmosphere uh, work in conjunction and create these electrical charges. Uh, we know that we have let's say the electrical uh, field or the magnetic field around the Earth right, that protects it. Well following these lines, these magnetic lines are these tubes, these huge plasma tubes and they were only recently able to see them using stereoscopic imaging using two telescopes and it was discovered by, I believe, a, a student in a college in um, Brisbane, I think, Australia. These are just average people finding these things, you know, but it, it, my point being that it doesn't have to be a deep scientific background in order to make a discovery. And a lot of people seem to think that these, we can trust these top scientists because they have the experience, but the average student can come up with some amazing realizations. Um, I'm not sure what to make of these plasma tubes, but I think that, uh, I, I just thought I'd put it out there so people can research it if they want. Now here's the one that got me, and this is the one I really uh, wanted to make the video about. Somebody else posted a small link, a link, I guess a link can't really be small or big, but uh, I should say it was a small comment with a link that nobody had really looked at, and I clicked on the link, and it was about a recent tsunami, well this was in 2012, a small tsunami that hit, um, I think, over in England or somewhere over there, in, you know, Europe, near Scotland, whatever. Uh, they said that the ocean just gradually went out like 150 feet and then came in and soaked the tourists. Nobody got hurt or anything. And, however, right before it happened, 
They said that everyone, uh, a lot of people in the area reported that their hair stood up on end, that there was a static charge in the air, an electrical charge, and that the air seemed to just kind of stand still, that it was kind of stifling, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Calm, super calm. And uh, then I read another report about people who had been, science, scientists who have been finding out that uh, right before an earthquake, there's a warming of the atmosphere in the ionosphere, I believe, and that we may be able to, we're on the precipice, on the verge of being able to measure these things and actually uh, predict earthquakes due to these occurrences. Now, there's two theories to it. One of them says that, uh, that the atmosphere is heated because of radon gas, which is released from the rocks deep under the earth as an earthquake is beginning. And as that radon gas is released, it reacts with the sun and creates a warmer spot in the atmosphere. But there's also the piezoelectric effect, which is when quartz crystals are squeezed, which is the same thing that's used like on your gas igniter on your barbecue grill, um, that's used in speakers, you know, piezo crystals. You may have heard that term. Um, the piezoelectric effect creates electricity through the uh, contracting, I guess, of, of quartz crystals. And they, that when an earthquake occurs, massive amounts of these crystals are compressed or disturbed at one time, creating a massive charge, or a static charge that is in the air. So if you're standing on the beach and your hair stands up on end, you might want to take that as a sign to move to higher ground. You know, that's just one of those things that we may overlook. You may just think, oh, I'm just kind of, maybe I'm having a scared moment or something, you know, but just knowing something that simple, like when your hair stands up at the beach, <laughs> uh, it might be an earthquake, you know, it could be. Um, but none of the, you know, all of the interest of all those things isn't what really gets me. It's the electrical nature of everything. The electrical vibration nature, nature of everything. Somebody and I were just talking about one of my subscribers. Uh, he asked me if I'd heard of Lee, Leeds Galin, and I said, no, I've heard of him, but I didn't really remember. And then he reminded me he was the guy who created Coral Castle, which was, uh, if you haven't heard, it's in Florida. Coral Castle is a giant. It was a, a, a small man, Edward Leeds Galin. He had this uh, property where he built these temples, and basically he, he claimed to have discovered the way that the pyramids were built and that what the Egyptians used. And he left all these clues when he died within the site itself as to how it was built. Um, it's, there's an amazing amount of information on it. Uh, it still hasn't all been decoded. And there are a, a, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of misinformation, and there's a lot of speculation <coughs> on how they move these stones, as well as how electricity ties into this. Uh, no consensus on it, but my theory is that and this is just way off of my own, you know, 25 years of looking into things and saying, what could it be? What could it be? How could they move these stones? I started to think that it's a combination of frequencies. Not one frequency, not one tone, but two or more frequencies combined to give a certain property to the stone, which in turn gives it an electrical charge maybe creates the magnetism, like in the I talked last night about how when you super cool oxygen down to its liquid state it becomes magnetic in nature and how my thought is that if multiple frequencies are applied to a certain substance then that, then that substance can take on a new charge which could allow it to say repel itself from the existing earth which would allow a stone to be floated. It totally, you know, pulling that out of my ass because I don't know and I haven't seen it in a lab. But since I came up with that, I've seen people doing very similar things in labs and I finally saw someone who had taken cross frequencies and they're able to float, you know, small items within a vacuum. And uh, the trick is how do you do it outside of a vacuum? And, uh, you know, you get to a point where it becomes, it goes from layman to scientific and you can't discuss the layman issues with the scientists because they're so far beyond it and you can't discuss the scientific issues with laymen because they don't understand it. So we think that us as individuals maybe don't have the capacity to discover these things and we do. Many of these awesome discoveries have been made by average people like you and me or students that maybe just uh, still had that, that gusto, you know, that believed in themselves. And so I guess my thought would be to each of you to 
don't underrate your own theories, yet don't overrate them either. Of course, you know, if one person has a theory and 99.9% .9 of the people say that that's not likely, it's probably either that you have something amazing or that it's probably not likely. You get back to Occam's razor, you know, whichever answer sounds like it most likely might be. But uh, when it comes to frequency, there are millions and millions and millions of combinations of tones and frequencies that can be used. And I've played with cymatics and water experiments as well as sand for those who have watched my channel for a while. About a year ago, I was doing a lot of sand experiments with magnetic sand speakers. And I started to realize that certain combinations of frequencies would create, I mean, you could do a, a single frequency and raise that up from 20 hertz up to 20,000 and it would gradually change the pattern on the water. But as soon as you say add, uh, you know, a thousand hertz and five thousand hertz together, that combination creates just a chaos within that water or sand. And uh, my thought is that with that right combination, you may be able to create that electrical nature, electrical charge. So. I guess in a nutshell I'm saying that vibration, frequency, electricity, magnetism are all one one thing. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. It's an amazing idea, but uh, you know, not an amazing idea, but an, it's an amazing uh, world of ideas out there that we can look into and come up with our own theories and, and uh, hopefully we're not so stuck in our own theories that we think it's the only way. But. Anyway, I guess that's all I got for now. <coughs> Electricity <coughs> is amazing. You know, we take it for granted. The power travels through our wires to our houses. And uh, when you really start to ask yourself what is electricity and start to learn about it and understand electron exchange and how, you know, these electron, uh, electrons are pushed down the line in order to, you know, that's what electricity is, electrons from an atom you know, and you start to, when you when you start to get into the, the 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 quantum realm as well as the atomic I guess the atomic realm would be more accurate. Um, you start to see that there's a lot of chemical exchange that goes on. For example, like when you take chlor chlorine and uh, you know you make make chlorine gas it's because you're exchanging, when you mix two, one may have a missing electron, one may have an extra, and when you combine those two, it creates this, a new compound by releasing these electrons. And that is a form of energy. And everything, all combinations of, uh, of elements can create these awesome reactions. And this is where the whole idea of you know, uh, you know, transmuting lead into gold or alchemy comes from. It's not a matter of actually changing anything into gold. It was always about a symbol, symbolic nature of the conversion of elements into other things, uh, or rather, the conversion of molecules uh, to combine to create larger things. But somewhere in there, there's an electrical nature to everything, and we've got to harness that. This is where free energy lies. That's why it's such an important thing to me. It's it's right there, right there, right here. You know, <laughs> a blanket or a piece of dirt, you know, things that can be turned into energy with the right frequencies, moved, I don't know. Anyway, peace out everybody, have a great day.